Hello. I'm Bruce Fretz. I'm here to introduce Emmy nominee, the marvelous Marin Hinkle. Such a wonderful episode, such a wonderful show. Thanks. I hadn't seen it ever big like this. It's only on my computer that I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's fun to so, see with an audience yeah. and hear all the laughter and everything. It's wonderful. Um, so how were you originally cast in this role? How, how did they find you for Rose? Um, let's see. So I live in Los Angeles, and I had actually been unemployed for a while and was hurting in terms of uh, needing insurance, health insurance. So I was calling the agents a lot. My dear agent is here. Thank you for answering. Um, and um, I was calling, and they set me out into the valley one day. And um, the, the description of character for Rose was she enters the room as if in an MGM musical. And um, I don't sing. So, um, but I, I kind of did some research and figured that she was also supposed to be in a robe. You know how Rose wears these amazing robes? Like there's like 20 of them or something. In fact, I've been trying to think of a good dress for the Emmys and I'm thinking maybe one of the robes <laughs> would work well. Or maybe I'll switch during the evening and wear a lot of the robes <laughs> and um, uh, see which gets on the worst dressed and which on the best dressed. But um, anyway, so I was trying to figure out how to be most um, theatrical because I feel, <coughs> excuse me, like, <coughs> excuse me, like a Amy's and Dan's work has this amazing um, largeness to it. And so I didn't want to be too small. And thank you so much. I didn't want to be too small in the audition. So I did something that's fairly unusual. And I, I suppose I do recommend it is, um, I decided that I would embrace that MGMness, And so I went to a costume shop in LA and I rented a beautiful robe and I actually rented a, a feather boa and I sewed it. And then I also decided I would put a wig on, which is so weird. I've done that a few times for auditions, but I really felt like I wanted more hair. And, uh, and I also wanted to, it to be a little bit period. So I, I, I got out of my car in the valley looking crazy, like a lot of actors <laughs> are in LA. And I walked into the audition. It was a, a wonderful casting director, Jeannie Backrap. And, um, and I, I think she was very respectful of me kind of going that far with it. So I put myself, well, she put me on tape. And then I said goodbye to it and tossed the audition sides, which they say to do, which I do. Not always do, but in this case, I really felt like that was good luck to let go of it. And I didn't hear for a long, long time. I'm sorry, this is a long story. You guys still okay with it? <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't hear for a long, long time. And they were probably casting Tony and Rachel and everybody else. And, um, and then when I did hear, they said that they wanted to fly me to New York, which is great. They don't do that that often anymore, right? Isn't that true? That they don't pay to have people. But I was, I was paid to go to have a vacation and see some plays. So I paid and um, came to New York. And I brought a lot of changes of clothes, because Amy sherman Pelletier you know, is really like a clothes horse. And I figured I had to sort of ask a lot of people's opinions. So I went to a secondhand clothing store in New York, actually, right next door to where I was staying. And I bought a lot of stuff. And I, I brought it to the audition. And I, I think I actually changed in the middle of the audition. I like wore one thing and I said, can I take a beat? And I walked out and <laughs> changed in and I did it again. And then I got back on a plane and I called the agents and they said, we don't know yet. And so I went home and tried to forget it again. And then I heard word that I had to come back again. So I came back and I flew back in. I saw more plays. Um, um, and I, um, and this time I just wore a simple black dress and I actually just wore my own hair and all that. And they were having the exact same sides, the same sides each time I was doing over and over and a million times. I don't know what they were looking for or what they saw, but they wanted to see over and over again. Anyway, then I, I flew back home and I got the role. Sorry, that was a long answer, but that was the story. So. So moral of the story is go to costume shops yes. um, or secondhand clothing shops if the roles are for a different time period. And also, I guess the other moral of the story, and you didn't ask this, but is, uh, you know, there was a little part of me early on in my career that would have thought, oh, that was too much. But I think that, you know, the older you get, I'm now in my 50s, it's like, it's it, at this point, if not now, when? So I felt like I'm going to give it everything. And if it feels a little embarrassing in the room, 
mm, well, it, as the French would say, something like tant pis or something like too bad, right? I don't speak French very well, but the, it's like, so what? You know, so I, it's like the caution to the wind thing. So I, I threw caution to the wind like four times <laughs> a lot. <laughs> So once you landed the role and you started working uh, on the scripts, yeah. how did you get up to speed with the pace yeah. of the dialogue? I mean, how do you keep up with that? You know, it, like uh, like a, with a like a wing and a prayer, I guess is what I do. <laughs> is I every single time I give Amy what she wants, it's never fast enough. It's incredible, and you see like Bailey, you know, the little adorable friend um, who comes in and goes on really really quickly. Like that is so fast what she's doing, and she worked on Bunheads with Amy, and so I did things like I watched those like. Alex, of course, who's a genius, and, and Bailey, and anyone else that had worked with Amy and Dan, I sort of like put my ear to them and just, <laughs> not literally, but I did kind of, you know, listen and by osmosis take on what they were offering and say, I better, you know, just like kick it up. Yeah. And that's kind of what I do is like musically, I just think, okay, if I'm at like nine speed, go to 12, you know, past 10 or what have you. So they yeah. basically always want it faster. Yeah. And then you had to go about the process of building the relationships with the other characters and the other actors. Um, let's start with Tony. I mean, you are such a wonderful couple on screen. I um, just, I love, I just love Tony. I cannot say. <laughs> it's funny. I recently did some press in which they said, do you want to wear something nice or do you want to wear a T-shirt that says, I love Tony Shalhoub? I was like, I'll wear the T-shirt that says, I love Tony Shalhoub. <laughs> so, and it had like an arrow or something. And I just stood right there and like pointed to him because that's like the best way to be is to just be his like, you know, whatever, our, his other half or something. Or, you know, I can't even call it the other half. I'm just so, I, I feel like... Every moment I have with Rachel and Tony, which is primarily the work that I've, I've gotten to do is with them. I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, do more cross fingers, even with Alex mm -hmm. and have a Lenny Bruce scene or what yeah. have you, you know. Um, but, but all I do is just take what they're offering and just be present with them because it's not even like it asks of me to act. I'm just so happy and so alive and crackling, you know. I mean, the only hard thing is sometimes they're wanting more friction and I feel no friction with them in real life. So, um, but but I can, you know, I conjure it up. And, 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 and the scenes in Paris with Tony, yeah. that was, you can talk, talk. <laughs> uh, I hear your daughter who's out here just got back from Paris. Yes, and, she did. You know, most of you probably have been to Paris. Like, uh, show of hands, how many of you have been? Yeah, exactly! <laughs> and is it not the city of love? It's the city of love. So I, when they when they told me, that's kind of a funny story. Um, mm. Yeah, what was it like uh, shooting in Paris? I mean, yeah, was, that it, was, really was it hard to stay focused because you were just so t you know taken away by yeah, the fact that you so were... Yeah, so I got a phone call um, in probably like February and we start shooting like a month or two after and they said, um, do you speak speak French and I was like um no but I'll learn and um and they said because we're hiring you a tutor and so then they hired me a tutor and for two months I conjugated verb after verb and and subjects and I kept on trying to ask writers or what have you like what is it that Rose is going to say can you give me some dialogue and they they had no dialogue, they had no script. And so it wasn't till like the night before that I actually like was up all night calling that French tutor and getting away from just the verb conjugations and trying to actually get the, the actual text. But um, then we, we flew to Paris and it was, you know, it really was a dream come true. I mean, I did, you know, my French was was lacking a bit, but I, I had a lot of, you know, people on the crew that would help me. and. And, and just, again, by osmosis and being around the city. There's this funny night. I, I was a little sleep deprived when I first got there. And so we were shooting right away. And I think we had an all night shoot. And so I was a little bit dizzy. And I looked out. And I, I saw this beautiful wall and this gorgeous kind of, maybe it was a cathedral we were looking at. And maybe it wasn't Notre Dame that night, but it was one of those like beautiful towers. And I said to the um, PA, not, you know, in broken English French, and I said, the scrim that they've laid out is so gorgeous. And the woman looked at me and she's like, you're crazy, right? You're foo. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, that's no scrim. That's like us. That's Paris. <laughs> and so I had been thinking that they flew in some beautiful like backdrop, but it was actually the real place. <laughs> so. And uh, working with Amy and Dan, who I'm sure most people know are a married couple in real life, and uh, really work together beautifully. Um, but particularly Amy, you know, a lot of the, the, the show is in her voice. Yeah. Um, is that a, a different experience for you, working on a show that's uh, primarily in a, in a woman's voice? Yes. Um, 
you know, I've been at this since I'm, you know, 22 or something. And again, I already told you how old I am. So it's that's a lot of decades. Um, but I can count on this hand how many times I've been directed by a, a, a woman. You know, like I was on Two and a Half Men for what? That was 12 or 15. Allison, my agent, was it like 12 or 15 years? It was a lot of years I was on Two and a Half Men. And I think they only had, they brought in a woman for like w w one week of that time. Other than that, it was all male directed and and also similarly I worked on this wonderful show on um, once and again that was also produced by two men I love Marshall Herskowitz Ed Zwick credit to them because they got me sort of starting the whole TV world here but um, but again there it was n never directed by a woman and so to have a female voice you know primarily you know obviously written by both of them but like her, her energy it, it's such a welcome thing in my in my life and at this time when in, in this culture when we want what we need more of it I, I feel really lucky yeah. why do you think the show has resonated the way that it has because it is a period piece and yet it seems totally relevant to, to what's going on today why do you think that has been the case you know, it's funny when Tony's asked that, I, I listen to him and he always says, you know, there's this thing about the zeitgeist and lightning in a bottle. You just, you can't quite predict like why a piece of work that you are in love with yourself, which is pretty much everything I get to do, I'm always feeling so lucky about, but why some of the pilots I've done work and, and go on and why some of them don't, I, I can't, I don't have an answer except, you know, Rachel is extraordinary. She's like this like Sprite, this wood nymph or something. She's really magical. And I think by, by them casting her, they, they have, you know, because it primarily is her, you know, her story and also Susie's too. It's really this partnership. And I think that we wanted more female stories like this. We wanted powerful young women who are not going to stop at no. And, and, you know, I saw even in that scene when she has the scene with Joel and Joel showing her the apartment. You know, I love how Rachel, I remember when she got to that sh scene, she just said, how am I going to do this? I don't know why I'm unhappy. But Amy just said, look, you don't want anyone to take care of you. Miriam is at a point in her life that she's figuring, you know what, I just had my husband walk out. And the one thing I need to do is not have him dictate what's happening. And similarly with Rose in those first two episodes of this second season, she's like left that ha family at, because she's sick and tired of nobody taking her seriously, you know? And so I think that's that's probably why it, it, it's hitting r the way it is right now, when, wouldn't you say, is that we, we need that. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your history. So you were born in Africa. I was. Your parents were in the Peace Corps yes. at the time, right? Yes. But you have no memory of, of that, I, I take no, it. No, my were mom tells me a story about a snake coming up through the drain. So I pretend I remember that, but I left it six months. <laughs> so I don't think I do remember that. So no, I, d I don't remember that. And uh, your parents were both very accomplished. Yeah. Your mother's a judge. She's a judge. And your father's a professor. Yes, he's retired. But yes. Uh, so, how did they feel about you going into acting? Devastated. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college, there was a, a wonderful moment, those forks in the road, where I was either going to go study abroad uh, in, in Dar es Salaam, in Tanzania, where I was born, or I was um, probably be a social worker or do hum humanitarian causes, perhaps do something very big and lofty and generous that way. Instead, I did this crazy other kind of thing. I, I decided to go to this uh, place called the O'Neill Theater Festival, and they had a, um, a year, well, it's a, it was a semester-long program. And so my parents, in their suits, drove me to the program because they had to okay it, and they were... Um, a little horrified at the fact that people were going like, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, oh, me, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was just so horrifying. But I convinced them that um, if they let me do a lot of peanut butter, peanut butters and stuff, and, and I did this program, and if, I, if, if it worked and the professors there thought that I was okay, that I would promise I would get a graduate degree so that I had the fallback so that if I never made it as an actor, I would be able to teach. And I swear, even to this day, I go visit my dad, who's 84, and every time I walk in his, his small, sweet little house, he says, have you thought of teaching? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, I, and even now, I haven't been back, I think, since an Emmy nomination. Maybe now he won't say the same. But probably he would still say, have you thought of teaching? But you initially uh, were training to be a ballet dancer, is that correct? Yes. I, when I was little, I had too much energy. I was a little, they probably would label it now, right, as one of those labels. But I was... Um, 
a little uh, hyper or ADD, whatever it was. I have one of my best childhood friends here. What would you say? Was I hyper? Yeah, she's nodding. I had a lot of energy. And so my mother sent me off to just get rid of the energy. So every day after school, I would go to ballet classes. And then uh, at some point, I, I, I got injured pretty badly when I was 16. So when I got to college, I went to Brown, which was a great, a great school with wonderful actors there. And when I got there, I figured I, I got to head back to the stage. And so I ended up you know, in class and decided I would pursue acting. And so who were your role models as actors uh, in those years? I mean, who did you really look to as? It's a great question. I was so lucky, fortunate. There was a, a, sl there were a slew of people at Brown at the time. Um, uh, Laura Linney was a couple of years above me. Wow. And so any play I did, I kind of would, she would finish her acting classes and I would stand uh, off after she got out of class. And I'd say, can I take you to lunch and can you help guide me? And <laughs> so I would take her to lunch and she would guide me. So it, w it was people like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was curious about some of the stage work that you did. Mm. Um, I, I know you played Juliet, Romeo and Juliet did. at Arena yeah. Stage. I, I, I did. And Jean Stapleton was my nurse. Yes. Oh my God. I wanted to ask you about that. What was that experience like? I have a story about that. She, um, we had a group of students come one day for a matinee performance, and maybe they, I don't know how they knew this, because I guess they watched reruns of, um, what was the, All, All in the Family. Yeah. And so you know how she went, Archie! Well, I guess she <laughs> said it with a little bit of like, Juliet! And so I think the audience started laughing, and but they were laughing in a way that wasn't respectful. And she actually stopped the show and turned to them and said, and like, I don't exactly know if she said like, stop. But it was some kind of like formidable, like, this is important. And they were silent after that and for the rest of the production like you could hear a pin drop and I'll never forget that like because obviously the rule is like you're never supposed to break the fourth wall and talk directly to the audience but she didn't feel that they were listening you know the right way and I thought that was sort of extraordinary that there was like all the rules uh, you know I learned in grad school which were never stop the show she stopped the show and she got the show like right back on track yeah. she was amazing yeah yeah and uh, since this is for the SAG After Foundation, we ask everyone, uh, what was the role that got you your SAG card? I would love to say, um, I was cast as um, Gina Davis's mother in flashbacks in a show in a film called Angie, and but originally I was cast as Madonna's mother because it was originally going to be a Madonna. That would have been interesting, right? <laughs> to always be able to say, like, I'm Madonna's mother. Um, but anyway, I got to have one line, which was uh, the line, uh, some stories don't fit inside a person's mouth. Some stories have to tell themselves. I couldn't get that line right at all the whole day. We, we, were, we were shooting it in Queens, and I was, like, crying. I was so nervous, and I couldn't get the line right. And, of course, now I remember the line years later. But um, anyway, that was I was so frightened. And then they flew me to, to L.A. I, I don't know if I've been to L.A. maybe once in my life. And I had to be barefoot. I was playing a crazy person. I played a lot of crazy people for a long time. You could argue maybe Rose is still. I'm playing a little <laughs> bit of a crazy person in her own way. But I had to dance on snow. And I was, they kept on saying, you sure you don't want to put on slippers? And I was so, like, I had so much, like, strong grit from being a ballet dancer. I was like, no, no, no problem. And I got home to having pneumonia. But, um, but it was all right, because I, I, I felt lucky still. <laughs> And so was that before or after you were on uh, Another World, the, the soap opera? That's true. I, you know, I was going to tell you that I did get my uh, SAG card doing Another World, but apparently that's after. Oh, so right. I, I wasn't exactly right. getting my card then. Right. But I did, yeah, I was on Another World. I'd never watched a soap opera in my life, and I still to this day have never watched one. They're, they're probably silly, right? But I, I, was, I was on that. I just remember the guy did a lot of binaca. Was that what it was called? That stuff that you spray? <laughs> and he kept kissing me, and I'd never done drugs. And I thought that he had like done drugs in the bathroom or something, and I got nervous that I was going to get high. I was so nerdy. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and I don't think it was drugs. He was just spraying the mints or oh, something. Yeah, but it could have been yeah. he was doing drugs yeah, in the bathroom. Yeah. I don't remember his name, so I'm not like calling him or oh, throwing him under the bus. I guess you could look it up. <laughs> Do you remember uh, your character? I mean, what, who you played on the show and yeah, what your storyline was Yeah, I think I played like? a complete, like, 
uh, what's the best way to describe it? Like a lunatic? <laughs> <laughs> I think her name was something like Alison D D DeWitt or DeMol or some kind of Frenchy kind. Of, oh, French again, France. I played like she had, she had a lot of money. I just remember that, and they had a lot of fancy clothes. I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> at all. <laughs> I mean, a lot of actors say that soap operas are, are a good sort of training ground because you have to do so much material. And I think some soap opera actors think that that's, you know, condescending in a way because it is really hard. Yeah, it was, it was really hard. Yeah. I, I really wasn't very good. It wasn't until I got cast in that show I was telling you about once and again that I actually, I feel like they're, Marshall and Ed were, they were like um, people's people. Like they really loved the grit of human idiosyncrasies. And there was, I don't know how many, did you guys watch Once and Again, some, some of you? It was a beautiful show and they had this. Makers of 30 something. And yes, they made life. 30 something yeah. by So Called Life. Anyway, they had these like, um, these black and whites where they would just put the camera on you. They were really before their time in a way. And they wanted you to just like behave in your crazy way. And so they really let you just be yourself. And I thought that was such a great training ground for me to not feel, um, like inhibited by a camera, but but to actually embrace all my. In grad school, they'd always taught me to like not move so much, like I'm everything I'm doing tonight. And they had taught me like keep your hands still and like use your lower register and like don't play with your hair, all that stuff. And the funny thing was that when I got to work on Once and Again, it was like no no no, forget your register, use your hands, you know, play with your hair, pick your nose. It's all far, part of the personality of the character. So. That was a good a good thing to learn is to is to sort of let go of your own judgment. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you were on Two and a Half Men for many years. Yeah, a lo long time <laughs> through Charlie, through Ashton. And yes, yes. On, yeah. um, well, what was that experience like? I mean, you weren't one of the Two and a Half Men. You were the mother of the half man and the ex wife yeah. of one of the men. Uh, you know, it's funny. We always thought it'd be kind of interesting to do like like the what was it the three other women behind the behind the scenes rather than two and a half men. So it would be like, you know, three women behind. And my character, I don't know if you ever, if you ever watched it, but um, thank you, thanks, thank you for watching. But um, my character um, was always at the door. Yes. And so I always thought that my biography could be like waiting outside the door or something <laughs> like that. So uh, how was that? You know, again, kind of like working with Tony, working with John Cryer is, that is a, a lesson in brilliant comedic timing. He is like the Jerry Lewis of our of our life, right? He has Pratt Falls. He has he can take a line that that you would be fearful is not funny, and just by like breathing, it, it like we would get audience response. He's that good. And Charlie was magnificent too. I mean, Charlie. I know there were some addictions apparently, but but but. <laughs> Uh, but I never, maybe back to my naivete, like that drug guy on Another World, but who wasn't really a drug guy. I didn't know if Charlie was doing anything at all. And it wasn't until we actually got the call that we weren't supposed to show up at work that I actually realized that maybe like he had an addiction to something. But because honestly, I never saw it. I swear I'm not just saying that because you're nice people and you're a nice man. I, I never saw any of it. I never, I never did. I'm, I Again, I could be naive, but I, I knew, yes, I mean, I knew that Charlie had I knew something but I kn he was so professional he was such a class act and the two of them together were so funny and I felt so lucky to work with them and I'm sorry that it kind of went down that he ended up not being on the show after that because I missed him yeah. and then my character wasn't needed very much after that so yeah. that was too bad but yeah. but but oh this is what I was gonna say about that the best thing about that was that I had a child and at nine days I went to work and I brought my child and breastfed him for the whole first two years of that show and you know for any actor that's out there thinking like what would be a great job to have while working and having a family it's a, it's a multi-cam because the the hours are amazing and you can bring your kid to work and then the other thing is you have a whole like summer off and I made sure that I called those agents and said get me a play and so I was able to balance that sitcom and take the money I was getting from that and put it towards the no money that you get from the theater world. And so I supported my habit, that's my habit, not a drug habit, but my theater habit was supported by Two and a Half Men. So. Very nice. Um, I wanted to ask you about a couple of the films that you were in. Uh, you were in uh, I'm Not Rappaport. 
with Walter Matthau and Ossie Davis, yeah. based on the play yeah. by Herb Gardner. Herb Gardner, that's a great story. Well, I, these are not, I'm saying it's great, but it's sort of <laughs> silly. What happened there was I was working on a play out of town, and I got a phone call saying that um, they were opening A Thousand Clowns on Bro Broadway in like, like, like in a moment, in like tomorrow. And would I come in and read for Herb? I had done I'm Not Rappaport, but in that film, I was only... Um, a memory, I was like Walter Matthau's like love memory or something, and I was sitting on a stoop up in Harlem and I had no lines. And, um, and so I went to read for Scott Ellis, um, and apparently he told me a sweet story. Herb had said to him, look at this woman, she's so right for the role. And then he had showed, her, showed um, Scott the film, and Scott watched it and was like, she could be right for the film, but she doesn't speak. So, uh, so anyway, so nonetheless, he he uh, auditioned me. Herb did for the part that would replace um, the woman who had she had walked out of of rehearsal. This actress, and they basically cast me, and I had my Broadway debut in less than a week of this play uh, that Herb Gardner had written, this extraordinary play, as you guys all know it, A Thousand Clowns. Anyway, that was a little bit of a roundabout th way of saying, never think that a role is too small, and if it, even if it doesn't have any lines, it could lead to your Broadway debut. <laughs> so. And how did your Broadway debut feel? I mean, with such little preparation, was that a blessing or a curse that you... You know, it's funny, um, I... Um, I don't even think that the cast knew my name on the first night. That's how that's how great Judd. I was working with Judd Hirsch. He was so great, so funny. But I remember there was a day backstage where I think he might have said to the stage manager, "What's her name again?" And I was playing like you know the, the love interest to him. But it wasn't his fault. It's just that he hadn't had time to work with me. Um, it was the most frightening thing you could ever imagine. Like as frightened as I was meeting Amy and Dan and wishing to get that this role, I, I was that frightened on opening night. Yeah. Um, a couple more quick questions sure. before we get to questions Anything. from the yeah. audience. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten from another actor that you could pass along to the actors here? Wow, this is a little um, like uh, vulnerable, but that's okay. You, you guys are good with that, right? So um, when I got out of grad school, um, I uh, I went to NYU, great program, had lots of loans. That's another reason two and a half men was good. Paid off the loans, <laughs> made the deposit for the house. Anyway, got out of uh, got out of NYU, um, and I did not get an agent. Most of my class, there's 16 of us, got agents. Thank God, because they were all brilliant actors. But I didn't get an agent, and um, I remember like sobbing a lot. Kind of, I, I felt like. Um, like in, when Harry met Sally, I felt like when Meg Ryan is crying so, so much in that room, I was like sobbing day in and day out. And I, I saw one of the women who was, um, you know, worked at, at NYU, and she said to me, she said, it's the best thing that ever happened to you was not getting an agent. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, with the, and she said, because you're going to learn how to work hard yourself at getting work. And a lot of the people who had the red carpets that were rolled out right away after after school, cut to like a few years from now, they may not have all the red carpets. So you're gonna have to figure out how to like without a red carpet, get backstage, you know, magazine, go to the equity calls, ask to be readers, um, you know, pound the pavement, and sure enough, you will figure this one out through grit. And sure enough, that is true. That the best the best advice I think I got was like. The grit actually teaches you how to persevere in this profession that so often is about not being employed. So, you know, that's what I learned. And speaking of red carpets, yeah. how does it feel to get your first Emmy nomination? It's, it's like dazzling and <laughs> like, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, because of what I said at the beginning of this, um, inter you know, time with you, uh, you know, so much of this time it, you're unemployed. So honestly, the only thing I ever wish for is to is to have a job. And so I don't. I've never thought about that other stuff until, I guess, you know, the day before they called and said, "Could you be on set if in case something, you know, happened?" And I actually was. Um, gonna go with my son on a bike ride on the vineyard and I had to weigh it and go it could be really weird to wait to see if you get a nominee that's strange right so I said I'm sorry I'm just gonna go bike riding and so sure enough I was bike riding and I was I, I assumed I'd sort of no nomination because it was like in the middle of the day and I thought you hear in the mornings for these kind of things so I got a phone call from my loving agent and she said hey hold on 
um, hold on one second. And I was like, oh, poor thing. She's going to have to say, you know, I'm so, so And she got on the phone. She goes, you know, you've got a nomination. And I literally screamed. I think the entire island of Martha's Vineyard heard me. And then I was like on the bike and calling and doing the whole thing with my son. So it was a beautiful day. And it was a great day to be with my child, too. Um, absolutely. A couple of quick questions for the audience. This is from, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Nubia or Nubla? Um, how has your character challenged you on, on Mrs. Maisel? Yeah. I don't think I'm very like Rose. Um, I, I feel like Rose has a really awesome backbone. And I feel like my mom has that. And then my ballet teachers over the years had that. The woman who ran NYU, Zelda Fitzchandler, who is extraordinary, she had that. Amy has that. Um, Rachel, Ale so I take from all these women that I'm in awe of, and I try and, and, and endow Rose with that fortitude. But um, but I, I, yeah, I feel like that's the biggest challenge for me is if I come on set with my Marin nerves, I often have to like do a lot of like, back to that peanut butter thing, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter. I have to be like, I have to like lower my voice and kind of find like something more edgy because I feel like that's like, like that's out there. And it kind of back to that day I auditioned, I have to like pretend that the wig, well, I actually wear a wig at the show. So I have to like don the wig, put the false eyelashes, put the corset on and like enter the room as if I am Rose. But that's my challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question from Dexter, what was your best moment so far on the show? Hmm. You know, that scene that uh, one of the reasons I selected this, this episode, um, is it's the scene where we're, maybe I felt something really romantic about seeing Notre Dame since the fire happened. That night was, it happened to be my birthday, and it was midnight, and we were shooting it. I didn't tell anybody, but um, I, by, I, you know now, I was a ballet dancer, so the idea that I got to be amidst all those dancers and dance with Tony Shalhoub on the Seine and, and, and see that Notre Dame background, I could not believe that anything could be more beautiful. So it didn't even matter. It was like, uh, that was one of, my, one of my most favorite moments. Well, it's a wonderful moment. It's a wonderful show. Thanks. Thank you so much Thank for taking you. the time Thank to join us. Thank you so us. much. Marin Thank Hinkle. you guys. Thanks a lot.